Hey everyone, welcome to episode 10, Remastered. Today, I'll be talking about a very important process to all life, called cellular respiration. When you breathe in and breathe out, you're breathing in oxygen and breathing out carbon dioxide and water vapor. Your cells do this too. To generate ATP, cells have to break down molecules of glucose. Now, ATP is unstable, so your cells don't store it. Instead, ATP has to be produced as it's needed with a small margin of surplus. So this continual need for ATP causes your cells to continually produce it, millions of times a minute. As a result, the cells continually consume molecular oxygen and glucose, and they continually produce carbon dioxide and water vapor as waste products. The collective respiration of all of your cells is manifest through your own respiratory rate. When you inhale, your lungs absorb oxygen. This oxygen is carried by your blood cells to be distributed to all of your cells and all of your tissues. Similarly, carbon dioxide waste is picked up and carried out to your lungs, where it gets exhaled. If you can't inhale, your body can't replenish the oxygen your tissues need. Without oxygen, tissues become anoxic and eventually die. Now, if you can't exhale, on the other hand, your body can't get rid of the carbon dioxide. It's just building up in your tissues. The carbon dioxide accumulates, and eventually, you succumb to hypercapnia. Your symptoms include a disorientation that turns to panic and hyperventilation before you fall unconscious, convulse, and die. As you can see, not breathing can quickly cause a host of serious problems, which is why you have to be constantly breathing. This is also why you can't hold your breath for more than a minute or so, and it's why you feel short of breath when you're doing physical exercise. Your cells are producing and using more energy, which means they need more oxygen, and they produce more carbon dioxide that you have to get rid of. You experience this in your macroscopic form as an increased respiratory rate, which is basically your body forcing you to serve more oxygen to your cells and to clean out the carbon dioxide faster. But this episode is about cellular respiration. It's not about macroscopic organism respiration. So with that said, let's dive into it. There are four main chemical pathways that are involved in cellular respiration. More specifically, the oxidation of a single glucose molecule is a process that has four stages. Each stage is a chemical pathway of its own, with its own complex series of reactions. The complete process for total oxidation of the glucose molecule creates about 685 kilocalories of thermal energy. This is enough energy to bring more than two gallons of room temperature water to a boil, so it's a huge amount of energy. Within the cell, this energy from the glucose molecule is not released all at once. If it were, the cell would explode. It would be like trying to contain a grenade by cupping your hands together. So in order to not kill itself, and to kill the organism it's a part of, the cell has to slowly eat away at the glucose molecule and consume its total energy bit by bit. This is where the four stages comes in. These stages are glycolysis, pyruvate processing, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain. Glycolysis produces two molecules of pyruvate, which are then processed into acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA is processed in the citric acid cycle, which is eventually converted into two molecules of CO2. Now, during these stages, ATP is being produced, and various energy carrier proteins are being activated. A sequence of redox reactions will harvest energy from the activated carriers, which creates a proton gradient across the mitochondrial membrane. The end of the electron transport chain is capped with a reaction called oxidative phosphorylation which does something really cool. But I'll save that for the very end. That's the reward at the end of all of this chemical labor. Okay, so let's start way back at the beginning, deep in the cytoplasm with glycolysis. Recall that the word hydrolysis means a chemical reaction that uses a water molecule to break a bond. Glycolysis is similar. During this stage, the glucose molecule is being literally broken up into smaller pieces by enzymes at every step. In order to initiate glycolysis, the cell has to first invest a little bit of energy, 
It's kind of like how you can't make an omelet without first buying some eggs. So to begin, the cell will spend a single ATP molecule, which will bind to the 6' prime carbon on a glucose. The first step of cellular respiration involves this ATP molecule, which is used by the enzyme hexokinase to phosphorylate the glucose molecule. The ATP becomes ADP, and the phosphate group, which was broken off the ATP, is now bound to the glucose's 6' prime carbon, which creates glucose 6 phosphate. As I move through these chemical processes, you'll notice a lot of logical structure in the naming convention for chemicals. Glucose 6 phosphate literally means a glucose molecule with a phosphate group on its sixth carbon. In the second step, an enzyme called phosphoglucose isomerase removes the hydroxyl group on carbon 4 and switches the orientation of the hydroxyl groups on carbons 3, 2, and 1, so it kind of turns the glucose molecule inside out. Additionally, the hydrogen on carbon 1 is replaced with a carbon that's bound to two hydrogens and a hydroxyl group, and this creates fructose 6 phosphate. In the next step, the enzyme phosphofructokinase consumes an ATP to add a second phosphate group onto the molecule, producing fructose 1 6 biphosphate. The bi prefix in biphosphate signifies that the molecule has bonds with two phosphate groups. The two ATP molecules consumed so far are the cell's initial investment in the cellular respiration process. At this point, the process cannot be stopped. Various enzymes cause the sugar to revert back and forth between glucose and fructose 6-phosphate, but once that second phosphate group is added, this reversible change cannot happen anymore. The substrate molecule is now locked in to its metabolic pathway, like a kid being locked into a cart on a roller coaster. At this point, the enzyme fructose biphosphate aldolase breaks the sugar molecule into two similar pieces, a glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecule and a dihydroxyacetone phosphate molecule. The fifth reaction step involves the enzyme triose phosphate isomerase, which turns the dihydroxyacetone phosphate into a second glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecule. Both of these glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecules are then processed in the same way through the next few steps. Two electron carrier molecules called NAD+ are reduced, and one phosphate group is added to each glyceraldehyde molecule. These redox reactions are carried out by the enzyme glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. The reduction of NAD+ in the sixth step creates two molecules of NADH and two protons. In the seventh step, the enzyme phosphoglycerate kinase removes one of the phosphate groups from the substrate and adds it to ADP to regenerate a molecule of ATP. As two substrate molecules are processed for every glucose molecule, this step will produce two molecules of ATP. The two ATP produced here recovers the initial energy investment that started the cycle, and so from this point on, any ATP that's generated is just energy profit. The substrate molecule at the end of the seventh step is 3-phosphoglycerate, a humble carrier of just a single phosphate group. In the eighth step, the enzyme phosphoglycerate mutase moves the phosphate group around in the molecule. It mutates it, creating 2-phosphoglycerate. The enzyme enolase will then dehydrate the substrate molecule, creating a carbon-carbon double bond, which creates the molecule phosphoenyl pyruvate. Finally, an enzyme called pyruvate kinase removes the last phosphate group and adds it to an ADP molecule. This step will produce two more ATP molecules per molecule of glucose. The substrate molecule is now pyruvate, which is the precursor molecule for the next stage of cellular respiration. Before I go on any farther, I want to recap the, I want to recap the glycolysis stage, because holy shit was that complicated. Okay, so first, a molecule of glucose is phosphorylated to make glucose 6-phosphate. This is modified into fructose 6-phosphate, and then it's phosphorylated again to make fructose 1,6-biphosphate. This molecule is split in half. It's split into two smaller molecules, each one possessing a phosphate group. Now both of these molecules are then phosphorylated again. 
which produces the substrate molecules 1,3 biphosphoglycerate, as well as two molecules of NADH and two protons. One phosphate group is broken off of each molecule to make two ATP and two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. The remaining phosphate group is rearranged, making 2-phosphoglycerate. The molecule is dehydrated, and a carbon-carbon double bond is formed to create phosphoenyl pyruvate. The remaining phosphate group is removed to produce another ATP, and then a pyruvate molecule. So to put it as simply as possible, glycolysis will take a glucose molecule and break it up into two pyruvate molecules, and it'll harvest some energy in the process. So now we can move on to pyruvate processing. These pyruvate molecules are then used in the second stage of cellular respiration. This stage is much shorter than glycolysis, and it takes place in the mitochondria instead of the cytoplasm. The pyruvate molecules will pass through both the inner and the outer mitochondrial membranes, and so they enter the mitochondrial matrix. Here, inside the guts of the mitochondria, exists a large enzyme complex called pyruvate dehydrogenase. This enzyme complex binds with the pyruvate and with another molecule called coenzyme A, or CoA for short. The pyruvate dehydrogenase complex facilitates a series of reactions that will fuse the pyruvate and the coenzyme A together. First, a molecule of carbon dioxide is cleaved off of the pyruvate, taking half of the non-hydrogen atoms in the pyruvate with it. An electron carrier called NAD+, is then reduced to NADH, oxidizing the CoA. Coenzyme A has a sulfhydryl group, which is used as the point of connection with pyruvate. This sulfur atom in the sulfhydryl group replaced the carbon atom that was lost to the carbon dioxide, and it binds the pyruvate and the CoA together into a single molecule called the acetyl-CoA. Just as pyruvate is the precursor molecule for pyruvate processing, the acetyl-CoA molecule is the precursor for the citric acid cycle, which is the third stage of cellular respiration. Before I discuss the third stage, I want to briefly discuss a few more details of the second stage. Pyruvate processing is under numerous regulatory controls dependent on feedback from both earlier and later stages in cellular respiration. A high concentration of ATP in the cell will cause some ATP to phosphorylate the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, and this will inactivate it. It'll shut it all down, and no more pyruvate will be processed into acetyl-CoA. This phosphorylation will happen more often when there's high concentrations of the products of pyruvate processing, namely NADH and acetyl-CoA. These high concentrations will stop pyruvate processing, kind of like the cell's way of saying, Hey, I have enough of this stuff. You can stop making it for now. Now, on the other hand, if the reactants of pyruvate processing, like NAD+, and CoA, exist at a high concentration, this will tell the cell that its supplies of ATP are running low, and that it should start making more. In this way, the concentrations of reactants and products will influence the rate of pyruvate processing, which regulates the rate of production of ATP. This is important, because extreme levels of ATP, either extremely low or extremely high, can be very dangerous for the cell. With extremely low levels of ATP, various metabolic pathways will begin shutting down as they lack the energy to continue functioning. Extremely high levels of ATP will cause unregulated phosphorylation, wildly activating and inactivating proteins, kind of like a child trying to fly a Boeing 747 by just smashing at all of the controls. Pretty much all of the chemical pathways in your body have regulatory mechanisms like this that try to prevent things from getting out of control. With that said, I can move on to the third stage of cellular respiration, the citric acid cycle. This cycle has eight steps, each step modifying the substrate molecule bit by bit and slowly oxidizing it. Much like glycolysis and pyruvate processing, this metabolic pathway has several mechanisms for regulation. Just like pyruvate, the concentration of ATP will influence the rate of chemical processing, of metabolic processing. A high concentration of ATP will tell the cell that it has enough, and ATP synthesis can be slowed down. Low concentrations of ATP tell the cell that it needs more, 
so ATP synthesis is accelerated. When it gets to high concentrations in the cell, ATP can bind and shut down many of the enzymes that are involved in the process. High concentrations of other products, like NADH, can also regulate the process by competitive inhibition with the substrate molecules. The first step in the citric acid cycle starts when an acetyl-CoA molecule binds to the citrate synthase enzyme. This citrate synthase enzyme will also bind to oxaloacetate, the most oxidized product of the cycle. Citrate synthase will take the acetyl group on acetyl-CoA and transplants it onto the oxaloacetate, which creates a citrate molecule. Now where oxaloacetate is the most oxidized product of the cycle, citrate is the most reduced. As the steps of the cycle progress, the citrate is further and further oxidized until it eventually becomes oxaloacetate and then gets reused in the next cycle. In the second step, the citrate is picked up by the aconitase enzyme, which dehydrates a hydroxyl group off of the central carbon. Aconitase then rehydrates the citrate by adding a hydroxyl group to an adjacent carbon, producing isocitrate. The isocitrate molecule binds to an enzyme called isocitrate dehydrogenase, and as the name suggests, this enzyme will remove a hydrogen from the isocitrate, oxidizing it. If something was oxidized, then something must have been reduced, and in this case, the electron carrier NAD+, is reduced to NADH. This step also produces a carbon dioxide molecule as waste, the result of the 6-carbon isocitrate being ground down into the 5-carbon alpha-ketoglutarate. The next step is functionally identical to the previous step. The alpha-ketoglutarate molecule is bound to the enzyme alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. You probably notice that both this one and the previous enzyme have the same N term dehydrogenase. This term implies that the molecule is an oxidoreductase, which oxidizes molecules by removing hydrogens. So the alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase enzyme will strip a hydrogen atom from the alpha-ketoglutarate and slap it onto an NAD plus molecule to produce NADH. Like step 3, this process also produces a waste carbon dioxide, which grinds the 5-carbon alpha-ketoglutarate down into a 4-carbon molecule. This 4-carbon molecule binds with coenzyme A to produce a molecule called succinyl-CoA. At this point in the citric acid cycle, we've gone only up to step 4. Now step 5 will bring in an enzyme called succinyl-CoA synthetase, which removes the coenzyme A group. This reaction will release energy and this energy is used to grab inorganic phosphate ions and ADP from the surrounding solution and slap them together to produce ATP. So step 5 is the first step in the citric acid cycle that actually generates any ATP. This step can also produce a similar energy molecule called GTP. ATP is adenosine triphosphate, the adenosine component being a nucleotide base. GTP uses the guanine nucleotide base, and so GTP is just guanine triphosphate. GDP is guanine diphosphate, and so on and so forth. Now like ATP, GTP can be tapped for the energy in its third phosphate group. The succinyl-CoA synthetase will remove the coenzyme A group, and this converts the substrate into a molecule of succinate. In the sixth step, the succinate is oxidized by the enzyme succinate dehydrogenase. Two hydrogens are removed from the succinate molecule, and they're given to the electron carrier FAD to produce FADH2. The removal of these two hydrogens creates a double bond between two central carbons in the succinate molecule, which converts it into fumarate. In the seventh step, the enzyme fumarase facilitates the addition of a water molecule to fumarate, which breaks that double bond and gives the substrate a hydroxyl group, and this converts it to malate. The eighth and the final step of the citric acid cycle involves the oxidation of malate by the enzyme malate dehydrogenase. It should be painfully obvious by now that enzymes with dehydrogenase in the name are oxidizing. During the oxidation reaction, this enzyme will cleave off hydrogens, 
and the hydrogens will bind to NAD plus to produce NADH. And this also converts the malate to oxaloacetate, the molecule which binds to acetyl-CoA in the first place, in the very first step of the cycle. Okay, so again, this was quite a lot of material, so I'm going to briefly summarize it. Pyruvate processing creates a two-carbon molecule called the acetyl-CoA, which then binds with oxaloacetate to produce the six-carbon citrate in the first step of the cycle. Citrate is converted to isocitrate, and then it's converted to alpha-ketoglutarate, and then that's converted to succinyl-CoA, and the last two steps of this process produce molecules of NADH. Succinyl-CoA is converted to succinate in a process that produces a molecule of either ATP or GTP. Succinate is then converted to fumarate, which produces a molecule of FADH2. Fumarate is then converted to malate, and then to oxaloacetate with a third NADH byproduct. The oxaloacetate is then used again with a new acetyl-CoA to restart the cycle. One whole revolution of the citric acid cycle yields one molecule of ATP, or GTP, one molecule of FADH2, and three molecules of NADH. So you'll notice that this doesn't really produce any more precursor compounds. We don't really have any more carbon compounds here that can be used as precursors for other fun modulating processes. All of the molecules that have been created from the citric acid cycle, ATP or GTP or FADH2 or NADH, these are all energy-carrying molecules. And the fact that these are energy-carrying molecules is very important, and it comes into play in the final step of cellular respiration. High concentrations of ATP, or NADH, can downregulate the cycle through negative feedback. ATP can phosphorylate and disable the enzymes working in steps 1, 3, and 4, and NADH can downregulate the cycle by engaging in competitive inhibition with the substrates in steps 3 and 4. Recall that steps 3 and 4 each produced a molecule of carbon dioxide as waste, and when each of those molecules was released, the substrate had one less carbon atom. Acetyl-CoA brings fresh carbon into the cycle, while this exhalation of carbon dioxide takes carbons out of the cycle. In this way, individual carbon atoms are slowly shuffled through the organism. Food is eaten, providing nutrients and energy which is stored as glucose. Glucose is stored in muscle tissue, being tapped when it's needed. The glucose molecule is metabolized through these chemical pathways, having its carbon atoms spun through several citric acid cycles before finally being expelled through an exhalation. When you engage in strenuous physical activity like weightlifting, your body is literally breaking down glucose and muscle for energy. You dissolve your own flesh for energy and shed all the waste gas out through your mouth. For that matter, virtually all animals do this too. All living things unconsciously use their bodies like mobile nutrient stores, consuming the molecules in their tissues for energy while expelling the waste products through their mouth, through breathing. Life forms have a dynamic consistency. They keep the same form and shape, but they roil with constant cyclical movement on the molecular level, constantly incorporating the new while cycling out the old, the cells squeezing out and harvesting as much energy from the whole thing as possible. And this finally brings me to the last stage of cellular respiration, which is the payoff stage, called the electron transport chain. So far, cellular respiration has only generated four molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose. It's also produced electron carriers, specifically two molecules of FADH2 and ten molecules of NADH. Now you might be wondering what all of these weird electron carrier molecules are, or what their purpose is. I've mentioned two of them so far, NAD+, and FAD, with their reduced forms being NADH and FADH2, respectively. And in the electron transport chain, both NADH and FADH2 are harvested for their electrons. A series of increasingly electronegative enzymes will shuttle the electrons to an oxygen atom, which ultimately creates a molecule of water. This process of harvesting electrons through a series of redox reactions creates a lot of energy, 
a lot of energy. So to see exactly how much energy is created and how, let's start at the beginning. A suite of proteins and coenzymes that are embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane will receive these electron carriers, and they'll process the electrons. These proteins and coenzymes are organized into four groups called complexes. Now, I'm going to throw a lot of molecule names and acronyms at you now, so buckle up. The chain starts when NADH donates an electron to an FMN protein, then to an iron and sulfur-containing protein called FES. This pair of proteins, FMN and FES, composes complex 1, which is also called NADH dehydrogenase because it dehydrogenates NADH. The electron carrier FADH2 gives an electron directly to an FES protein, which is, by itself, the much simpler complex 2. Complex 2 is called succinate dehydrogenase, and it's also used in step 6 of the citric acid cycle to oxidize succinate. Anyway, the FES proteins will then give the electrons to a coenzyme called ubiquinone. Ubiquinone, or Q for short, is a lipid-soluble, non-protein quinone molecule, which is common in most cells. Q is lipid-soluble, so it's hydrophobic. It hangs out in relatively high concentrations inside the inner mitochondrial membrane, floating between phosphate groups and the other proteins in the electron transport chain, and it facilitates electron transport between them. So complex 1 and 2 both expel oxidized NAD+, and FAD molecules, respectively, back into the mitochondria, where they get reused in other reactions. So at this point, complex 1 and complex 2 have both taken an electron from their electron carriers, and they've given the electrons to Q, ubiquinone. After being reduced by taking on these electrons, as well as a number of protons, Q will float through the membrane before being oxidized by complex 3, called cytochrome C reductase. This protein complex will shuttle electrons, one at a time, across a series of proteins called, in order, cytochrome B, another FES protein, and cytochrome C1. For each pair of electrons, the cytochrome C reductase complex will move four protons into the intermembrane space the space between the inner and outer mitochondrial membranes. Complex 3 reduces a protein called cytochrome C, which moves across the outer surface of the inner membrane, searching for complex 4. The cytochrome C is oxidized by complex 4, which is why it's also called cytochrome C oxidase. See, these names have a logical structure. Cytochrome C oxidase oxidizes cytochrome C. Easy! <laughs> so complex 4 has a protein called cytochrome A, which oxidizes cytochrome C and shuttles its electrons to a second protein called cytochrome A3. From here, the electrons are used to reduce molecular oxygen, O2. This reduction of molecular oxygen ends the electron transport chain by creating two water molecules, supplying the energy for another two protons to be pumped into the intermembrane space. Now, if you were paying close attention, you might have noticed that at complex 1, complex 3, and complex 4, protons are constantly being moved across the inner mitochondrial membrane, from the matrix into the intermembrane space. It isn't fully understood how the protein complexes pump protons across the inner mitochondrial membrane, but what is understood is the raw significance of this. By pumping protons into the intermembrane space, it creates a proton concentration gradient. The concentration of protons is very high in the intermembrane space, so the rules of diffusion suggest that protons will exhibit a net movement across the intermembrane and back into the mitochondrial matrix, where the concentration of protons is much lower. It's lower in part because the protons in the matrix are being actively pumped out. The proton motive force is the force of the protons moving across the membrane as part of this gradient. This concentration gradient of the protons can be exploited by various enzymes to fuel their own reactions. Hands down, the most important of these complexes 
is ATP synthase. ATP synthase has two parts, called F1 and F0. F1 is often called a knob because of its doorknob-like shape. F0 is a tube-like structure that's embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. The F1 and F0 proteins are connected by two structures, a rotating shaft that's turned by the rotation of F0, and a stator, a piece that holds the subunits together, it holds them statically. So the F0 protein facilitates the rapid transport of protons across the membrane, following their concentration gradient. As the protons move through the interior of the F0 protein, they will cause it to turn, or spin. This is like water going through a turn rotating device. As the water flows through it, it'll make it spin. This turning causes the rotating shaft to spin too, reaching speeds of up to 350 rotations a second. The shaft sits within the center of the F1 region. Its rotation doesn't cause the F1 to spin as well, but it does cause the subunits of the F1 protein to undergo a conformation shift. This conformation shift allows the F1 region to catalyze the phosphorylation of ADP, producing molecules of ATP. In this way, ATP synthase operates exactly like a river turbine. The protons are like the stream of water, coming downhill or down their concentration gradient, where they push through the river turbine, turning it and producing energy. ATP synthase, however, can work in reverse. If the proton concentration gradient is reversed, where diffusion moves protons out of the matrix and into the intermembrane space, ATP synthase can work backwards, hydrolyzing ATP for the energy that it needs to pump protons back out and re-establish the correct gradient. Remember how earlier in the episode I said that the first three stages of cellular respiration only produced four ATP molecules per molecule of glucose? Four molecules of ATP really isn't that much, especially when the cell has to invest two ATP molecules just to get everything started. The electron transport chain doesn't produce any ATP at all. It just creates a proton gradient that gets exploited by ATP synthase. It's the ATP synthase that produces a boatload of ATP. But the question is, how much ATP can ATP synthase synthesize? The answer is more than six times as much as the rest of cellular respiration put together. ATP synthase creates up to 25 ATP molecules per molecule of glucose, which means that the entire process of cellular respiration, with all four of its stages and the oxidative phosphorylation at the end, produces 29 molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose. When you hear that glucose is an energy storage molecule, this is how that energy is harvested on a chemical level. This is what it produces. 29 molecules of ATP. So a million molecules of glucose can produce 29 million molecules of ATP. That's not a bad exchange rate. It makes sense why we share an endosymbiotic relationship with mitochondria. These first cellular symbiotes would have provided enormous benefits to each other. The cell would give nutrients to the prokaryotic mitochondria in exchange for a hugely improved energy generation system. This endosymbiotic relationship was so useful and so beneficial that it has persisted in all eukaryotes to this day, enabling the large and complex life forms that we see around us. Every single cell in your body is an endosymbiote, packed with many tens to hundreds to thousands of mitochondria. Now I want to end this episode by very briefly talking about fermentation which is a less potent energy production mechanism that doesn't require oxygen. Fermentation is an anaerobic process, conducted in low oxygen or oxygen-free environments. You probably know that fermentation is used to create bread and alcoholic drinks. Fermentation is kind of like a backup energy production system in eukaryotic cells for when the electron transport chain fails, or is overloaded, or otherwise disabled. Fermentation can produce ATP, but not nearly as efficiently as the oxidative phosphorylation at the end of the electron transport chain. Cellular respiration produces 29 ATP per glucose, but fermentation only produces 2 ATP per glucose, and it produces a lot of waste, too. 
When you're breathing hard and you're engaged in strenuous physical activity, your muscle cells are processing oxygen in and carbon dioxide out as fast as possible. If you keep working out and this strenuous condition continues, then your muscle cells will become less and less able to provide the necessary oxygen, making your tissues oxygen stressed. In this context, your muscles begin to produce lactic acid as a waste product of a fermentation process, because they engage in fermentation to try to squeeze out every drop of ATP that, that it can. Specifically, fermentation involves the recycling of the NAD plus and the NADH molecules that are involved in glycolysis. Pyruvate, or sometimes a modified intermediate molecule, will oxidize NADH back to NAD+. After oxidizing NADH, the pyruvate, or pyruvate derivative, is converted into a waste product like lactic acid or ethanol, where it's then broken down or expelled. So basically, glycolysis produces two ATP and two NADH, as well as two molecules of pyruvate. The pyruvate molecules either directly oxidize the NADH produced in glycolysis, or they're modified slightly before oxidizing the NADH. Either way, the NADH gets oxidized back into NAD+, which can then be used again in future glycolysis cycles. In muscle cells, the pyruvate oxidizes the NADH and becomes lactic acid. The bacteria cultures in yogurt will ferment lactose into lactic acid, which gives the yogurt its creamy texture. In yeast, carbon dioxide is removed to produce acetaldehyde, which then oxidizes NADH to become ethanol. Humans are facultative anaerobes, meaning that we can use fermentation when our tissues have low levels of oxygen. Some species, like some of the anaerobic microbes living in your gut, produce all of their energy through fermentation processes. You eat food, the microbes help break it down, and they get their cut of the nutrients, and you get your share of the nutrients and the energy that you wouldn't have been able to biologically access without those microbes. Needless to say, anaerobic microbes that only use fermentation to produce energy are necessarily quite small and simple, because they just don't have the energy production capacity to become large and complex. And with that said, that is about it for this episode. I know that this was a really technical episode and I really just drowned you in names and terms and enzymes and reactions, but I wanted you to know the enzyme complexes. I wanted you to know the substrate molecules and the waste products that are used in each step of cellular respiration. I wanted you to know all of this so that you can just see how intricate and detailed and non-linear this chemical pathway is. I hope all the technical information wasn't too dry and that you were able to learn something cool about the way that cells generate and use energy. And as always, thanks for listening.